Welcome to Inside Racing. Australian racing has produced some brilliant apprentice jockeys over the years. Kids with a natural gift who, despite a lack of experience, have been able to compete successfully against the very best jockeys. None have had a more spectacular apprenticeship than Melbourne's Jeff Lane, who in the 1950s won five successive junior titles and while still an apprentice, won the 1959-1960 Victorian Jockeys Premiership. In his teen years, he was riding some of Victoria's best horses and generating amazing publicity. He had only one battle and that was with ever increasing weight, which eventually forced him out of the saddle. He came back after three years and proved that the old magic was still there. The Jeff Lane story has taken many twists and turns since then, and I'd love you to share that story with me. I caught up with Jeff recently on the Gold Coast and recorded an interview I've been wanting to do for a long, long time. He was as surprised as I was when we realised that this was the first time we'd ever met. Very hard to believe, John. Amazing. Very, very hard to believe. Mind you, you have lived in Hong Kong for 37 years. That's very true. Actually, I went to Hong Kong in 1971 on an eight-month contract, would you believe, and uh, I finished up spending, what, 33 years there. Yeah. And then the last three years, I moved across to uh, Macau. But, um, oh, I don't know, that, that was the early days of, uh, well, the later part of my racing, and... Uh, we can go way back to the start, I guess, way back in 1952, 53. Yeah. In the early days where um, I was I was never involved with horses at all, but my... There was absolutely uh, no racing background at all. No racing background in the family at all, no. But uh, as a youngster, I was very small and very light, and around my, say, bedroom room, I'd have photos of jockeys and, yeah, yeah from the old sports novel and turf monthlies and so forth, and... Um, and I'd, I'd sit on the floor and do my own form in the old newspaper and the old yeah. black and white sort of thing and uh, tune in, tune into the old radio wireless and uh, take it from there. I'd do my, you know, mark my selections. Now, Jeff, I wonder if the small stature to which you refer was a result of a bout of meningitis when you were a baby. I think uh, you hadn't turned one. Uh, when you contracted meningitis, a very nasty illness in an infant. What did your mum tell you in later years about uh, the serious nature of that? Well, I believe that uh, I was 12 months old. Actually, I won my first cup at the age of 11 months in a baby show. Yeah. And then about a month later, that's when I went down with meningitis. And um, the doctors, first of all, they said I wouldn't survive. Yeah. Uh, they said I had about 15 minutes to go and... I pulled through, but they said, well, I'd yeah, sort of like be deaf and dumb and that because there was no life at all in the body. But eventually I started talking and, um, and basically that was it. So I've, um, now at the age I am now, I've had a great life, considering what could have happened at the yeah. age of 12 months. What might have been. What may have been, yes. Now, yeah. I think your <laughs> mum in those early days might have been hoping that she had a young Fred Astaire on her hands because mum had been a ballet dancer in her early life and she actually arranged some sort of dancing tuition for young Geoffrey at one stage. Well, that she did, like, uh, we'd travel around the country a lot, but uh, she'd be in charge of the dancing, you know, for the school, for the young students, the young ones, and... Uh, but she was very keen for me to become a dancer, yes. But uh, I'm afraid it wasn't my... My kettle of fish, I'd, I'd no. be standing on everyone's toes, more or less. So, uh, yeah. And uh, it was only at a very young age that I... It was my brother who was working on a furniture van, moving an owner, say, let me say, from Frankston to Dandenong, mm. and uh, he got talking to this gentleman who owned horses. And uh, he said, well, look, he said, next Thursday I'll be going to Mentone. My horses are with Tommy Woodcock, if you like we just moved to Springvale, we'll call in, pick Jeff up and take him to meet Tommy Woodcock. Mm. Now, the front doorbell goes, here's the gentleman, uh, well, Mr Storer was his name, mm. would you believe that he and my father fought in the Second World War together? 
So a million to one. A million to one chance, and and that's how my career started off. We'll talk about uh, your brother Frank at this stage. Here were you, small enough to become a jockey. Mm, yeah. There was Frank, well over six <laughs> feet, and a big strapping bloke. Your late brother Frank. Yes, very true. He 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 had played a few games for um, uh, St Kilda. It used to be the VFL in those days. It's now the AFL. And uh, from uh, St Kilda, he moved across to. Um, Oakley, where he spent about five years, but uh, mm. Frank was one of the uh, the tough boys on the field. He, if there was a fight, he'd be there mm. to protect the uh, the smaller guy. You have two sisters, Bev yes, and Loretta. Bev and Loretta. So naturally, uh, none of the girls were involved in racing, so it was basically just myself. Despite having no racing background, uh, you had, by this stage, a burning desire to become a jockey. As you mentioned, you were introduced to a man who was already a racing legend. The remarkable Tommy Woodcock, destined to become mm. your mm. master. Amazing. Did he take you well, on a trial period? Well, yeah, when I think back now, like, I suppose in those days I probably didn't really know who Tommy Woodcock uh, was. I knew uh, later on, naturally, involved with Farlap and that, but mm. um, it was 1952 and we broke up from school early December. So I went and did two weeks before Christmas mm. uh, to see whether I'd you know, enjoy like 10 days, 10 weeks. And I said, yes, I would. So, so uh, after Christmas, I went back in January. Uh, I had to get special permission though from the schooling because I was then the age of 13 and I would have been turning say the age of 14 in March, which meant only going back to school for a short period. And uh, so we got that permission and I started my apprenticeship in 1953. Tommy Woodcock had worked in racing stables in the harsh depression years of the 1930s when children were seen and not mm -hmm. heard and he carried that kind of discipline into later life. Now he was a genteel softly spoken man but he was a tough taskmaster too. Well he, he was, um, as I say when I started he, there were about six horses in work and um, as we increased, I was riding winners, the stable increased and I tell you, if I never made it as a jockey, I would have been great as a carpenter yeah. because as the stable increased, we had to build more stables. So I'd be up there with a hammer and I even built a two horse horse float once, uh, yeah, with, with, uh, with the boss, with Tommy mm. and that and built a little uh, chair in the back of the horse float where you'd have to sit and that's where I would sit going to the races. Yeah. And then if something went amiss with one of the horses, a little buzzer. You have to squeeze and that go into the... Uh, you know, he proved the in the Farlap era that he was a horseman of special talent. Now, you were there long enough to decipher uh, what he was all about. What do yes, you think yes. was Tommy Woodcock's secret? He was... Um, what can I say? He was... Uh, he, he never very... He, you know, he never spoke very much. He never spoke very much about Farlap. And even in the house... Uh, there, there was a trunk, and I guess it, it had some rugs and uh, racing gear and that of far but there were never photos around the room of the house and that. And I used to, I had to live in the house, in the in the bedroom next to where, um, well, let's say Tommy and Emma Woodcock were, mm. because uh, at 4 a.m. in the morning he would turn the light on, and I'd have to wake up and make sure I was, yeah, working. But he was, you know, he, he was very good, but uh, he, he'd say, right, we're breaking in yearlings. And he'd give me the responsibility of breaking in yearlings as, you know, as I got older and that. And to me, that was a big help in learning about the thoroughbreds and their manners and becoming very close with them. He was a very, very kind man, you know, with the, with the horse and that. Very kind. You, you were never allowed to hurt a horse. And uh, if a horse was uh, badly injured or so forth, he would, um, mm. yeah, great respect that way. 
You say it's, Tommy Woodcock rarely spoke of Farlap. He was deeply affected by Farlap's death. He cradled yes. the head of the horse in yes. his lap yes. as Farlap took his <clears throat> final breath. I don't yes. think he ever got over it. I would say not, and I think he reenacted that in many ways with another horse called Reckless at a later stage, but as I said, he was very kind with all thoroughbreds. Mm. And um, yeah, he probably never got over it. it was, yeah, when you think back, it was what a great horse he must have been. In my time, when I'm saying my time, in uh, in Australia in the early 50s, Tullock would have been one of the best horses that I yeah. Ra yeah, raced against. Mm. It's hard to believe that in August 1953, when your indentureship papers were finally signed, mm -hmm. you were four feet eight and five and a half stone. Yes. I just thought I'd remind you of that fact. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> You're very kind. Thanks, John. <laughs> yes, because um, in those days your apprenticeship uh, was, you would sign up and you'd go right through to the age of 21. Uh, no matter how many winners you'd rode. Now, yeah. I'd lost my allowance at the age of 16. So actually I rode the last five years through as a full uh, as a fully fledged jockey. Yep. But I still had to work in the stables, mm. you know, doing my cause there and so forth. But um, because in the early days in the 50s in the state of Victoria, we only had metropolitan racing on the weekend, mm. no midweek racing. The midweek racing was country only. And the amount of winners you rode for lo losing your allowance had to be metropolitan winners. Mm. So um, it took me 11 rides before I rode my first winner. So I got my licence when I was 14 yeah. in February. Mm. But there again, I turned the age of 15 the next month. Yeah. And, and then it was in July I rode my first winner after 11 rides. What a magical moment. It's, it was. It was Flemington. at Flemington. Grand Flemington. National Hurdle Day. Yes. And it was a mare called Halle in the Braybrook Handicap. Yes. 16 to 1, 1 by 3 and a half lengths or so forth. But, but also, uh, apprentice to me at the same time was a jumping jockey called Glenn Bilney. It was a significant with, figure in your early life, wasn't he? He was. Glenn and I, we were very close. In it. But I think Glenn won the Grand National on that same day. On a horse called Sidlaw. Sidlaw. So it was great memories. But I've, I've, I've got photos at home when I rode my first winner. The saddle over my arm with the number 8. And, uh, of course, you're going to Hong Kong, number eight is a very, very lucky number. Now, there so, was another special touch about the, the race and the occasion. We've got an old photograph here, an old magazine shot of yeah. Halle returning to scale. Yes. Wearing one of the bridles that's in true. which Farlap raced. Raced. Very true, yes. That's one thing that the uh, boss did remind me of. Um... Now, she was also a mare that I looked after, you know, strapped in the, in the stable. And uh, the owner, Bill Stutt, I don't think Tommy actually wanted to put me on the mare because Jack Pertell and Brian Gilders and Ronnie Hutchison had been riding the mare. And uh, Bill Stutt said, no, give the lad a ride. And uh, so that was the start of my career. You had two or three heroes at this early stage of your career. And one of them was Bill Williamson. Yes. who was admired by so many young Victorian jockeys. Yes. Many jockeys that I've had the pleasure to interview always give Bill Williamson a special mention. Yes, well, <coughs> he... Um, there's a great trainer called Father Hoisted, F.W. Hoisted. This is at Mentone. And Bill Williamson was his main rider in those days. And I did... I was riding a lot of track work with Bill and... He'd have a very straight back, you know, on a horse, and um, we sort of grew up. And then I became very close with him, and Bill was a very fussy man and very clean. His race gear was always polished, and his car was the same. Eventually, I'd ask him, could I have a ride to races one day? And he said, yes. And it meant to in those days, like we, I lived in Warrigal Road and the P and Highway, it's just an ordinary crossroad well now it's mm. totally different but before i stepped in the car i'd have to you know clean the boots and yeah you know, really? make sure there's he no insisted. dust he insisted yeah. but uh, a wonderful man you had a spectacular apprenticeship you won the junior riding title in each of the five years of your apprenticeship 
totalling more than 400 winners. You must look back on that now with some disbelief. Well, now you say that I, I went through a few of my old scrapbooks and I did, I said to my wife Joni the other day, I said, I didn't realise that, you know, some of the things that one did achieve as a, at a very young age. Yeah. And, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's great memories. I like to have my life all over again doing the same thing. But it's, yeah, I think it was five or six years in a row being the number one and then also finish up being, being the number one jockey against these top boys. You generated an enormous amount of press in that era. You couldn't pick up a Melbourne newspaper without a Jeff Lane story appearing somewhere in the sports pages. Somebody mm. coined the nickname for you, the Golden Boy. Golden Boy, yes. And it persisted for many years. I mean, how does a kid at 18 or 19 years of age keep his feet on the ground with that sort of adulation all around him? Well, they gave me that name when I was 15, 16, yeah. really. And you know what? I, I still go back home occasionally. And a lot of the boys, they still call me the golden boy yeah. after all those years. It's, it's great. You know, a lot of the old sporting personalities, and that, which is great news. First major win, according to my uh, records, Glitzen in the Alistair Clark Stakes. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, trained by um, <clears throat> Father Hoisted. Um, gee, I must have been only 16 or something, if I recall, in those days, because yeah. it was my first ride back after a nasty fall. And uh, I can remember the... Uh, I think Ian Saunders ran second on the horse. Did he? So that would have been, yes. Yeah. And then I think my first... I won the Oaks, I think, about 1957 on a mare called a Marco, so it would have been one of my other early wins. And there's a good story attached to a Marco. You were also her strapper. Yes. Out yeah. she comes to win a Group 1 Victorian yes. Oaks, her only win. That's very true. She was a half-sister, actually, to Halle, my first winner, at a mare called an Olive. And, yes, that was the only race that uh, she won. She went to stud, and then the uh, first foal that she threw was Tobin Bronze, yep. whom I had two rides on for two wins. Mm. So there's a... Connection. A connection. I think the first really top-class horse you rode on a regular basis was Golden Doubles. He was a great favourite with the crowds. You won a string of races on him, including two William Reed stakes. Yes, yes. Yeah, a very game little horse, uh, trained by um, Hal Hoisted from Wangaratta. And uh, he, there was a bit of a story there also. I was winning races on him, but then I was barred by the stewards to ride him because we had the five-strand barrier, yeah. and he's a very strong, difficult horse to handle. And he would break through the tapes and, you know, want to get strong Knock up. your gone off. Oh. So the yeah. stewards barred me from riding him, race riding him, and then... Uh, Reggie Heather took over the race riding. But then, shortly after that, the starting gates came in. And so I was reinstated, and that's yeah. how I went on and uh, won more races with him. The 1957-58 season was a beauty for G Lane. 35 city winners, Saturday racing only in Melbourne in that mm -hmm. era, breaking a very old record held by Harold Skidmore. Yes, yes. Well... Yeah, it's, as I say, when I'm reading back all this, it's, it's hard to believe that uh, you know, one sort of has to pinch himself to say, well, did it happen? Mm. But it did happen, and the, the records are there to prove it. But uh, I don't know, it's sort of... Sometimes it seems like a dream. A dream, exactly. Yeah. To turn around and say, by the time I was 18, I'd ridden a winner in every capital city of Australia also. Mm. Jeff, you were 19 when you became associated with a remarkable horse called Lord. He was trained by Ken Hilton. He raced until he was nine. He won 28 and a half races. 
you rode him in 17 of those wins. Three yes. Memsies, two Caulfield stakes, two Underwood stakes, two CF4 stakes, and an All Age stakes in Sydney. I thought he won four Memsies stakes in a row, to be honest. Well, you might be right. right. You might <laughs> yeah, be right. My, so. my research might have let me yeah. down here. He was, uh, what he, a, horse. He, he was a, look, a very big, plain gelding. Uh, long striding action was inclined to want to lay out many times in his he races. He could be a pig, I read somewhere oh, he, in his races. Before I rode him, um, Kenny Ford was riding him one day in, in a sprint race that, mind you, would have been only a two year old probably yeah. then. And about 50 metres from the post, he put his head down and really pig rooted at a full gallop, mind you, which mm -hmm. he, he had some nasty manners, but he was a great horse. Good horse to, for me. You had mixed feelings uh, in Sydney regarding Lord. As you said, you won the All Age Stakes on him. Uh, at the same carnival, you won the Adrian Knox Stakes on Chicola. Yes. But then you rode Lord at Warwick Farm in the Chipping Norton Stakes. How many runners? Only three or four? Can I forget that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Never, because... Uh, he was long say, odds on, wasn't he? He was Shannon's odds, for sure. Yeah. And, uh, as you say, three runners. And uh, Neville Soward rode the winner on a horse called Caesar. And, uh, but, yeah, I got a nice welcome returning to scales. So, mm. yeah, the Sydney public were very, very generous for me that day. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Strongly <laughs> advise you to get back to, to Melbourne. To go home. <laughs> <laughs> as quickly as possible. Uh, yes, yes. So here was a horse that could lay out and do things wrong, and yet he won mm. 28 and a half races. What a mm. motor he must have had. You know, one of the races I rode him in, we ran second. But I returned to scale. I must say, with a little tear in my eye, because it was the Queen's Cup or the Queen's Plate or something at Flemington, yeah. and it was Tullock having his first start back after a long illness. Yep. Yeah. We came down the straight, Neville sold myself, Lord Tullock, head and head, and I kept saying, well, I've got to defeat him. You know, he hasn't raced for so long. Two years. And, and he, mm -hmm. it was a bob of the head at the finish, and uh, I always maintain that in my era, the horse that I saw, Tullock, was one of the best mm. because he was, like where Lord was a big, plain, gangly gelding, Tullock was like a little horse, was like a sway yeah. back. And there were, was the, great emotion that day that as day, Tullock came back to scale. Very much so, very, very much so, yes. In part two of the Jeff Lane story, the former champion jockey pays tribute to another of his favourite horses, the gallant Dorlagiri. You know, he was, um, you know, he's well named that horse. A lot of people don't realise. He was by a sire called High Peak. And Dorla Gerry, I think, is the fourth highest mounting in, yeah, you've got Mount Everest and so forth. The fourth highest mounting is Mount Dorla Gerry. So he was very, very well named. He reflects on an exciting contract to ride in Germany as stable jockey for the Baroness von Oppenheim. She was a wonderful lady. Spoke seven different languages and uh, I kept in touch with her really right up until she passed away. Jeff remembers his disappointment when increasing weight forced him out of the saddle. It was sort of getting that way, the rides were becoming very limited and um, I had to make a decision so I, I did, I gave up race riding not knowing what I would do so what do I do? I went into the restaurant business. He talks about an eight-month Hong Kong contract which turned into 37 years. First part, I rode, I rode for seven years, from 71 or eight, eight years to 79. I never rode very much because the first year they kept the weights up very high to the like amateur racing weights, but eventually then they dropped the weights down to a much lower scale, so I was probably averaging 40, 50 rides a season. and uh, but. We just sort of got the bug living in, you know, living in Asia and that. It was a total different way of living, and um, and you do get spoiled in Asia. You, know, you have your drivers and maids and so forth. It's yeah. it's a nice way of living. Yeah.